All right, it's going. Hi, I'm Ryan Bowe, quality control team lead at Wolpert. And I've been there for about four years, but I've been in the industry for a lot longer. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a lot of different things that have to do with my career and I'm framing it around spatial selection. So let's get into it. And by the way, before I advance off this slide, let me tell you a little bit about it because I really like it. And it's one of my favorite things that I've done to combine a lot of different things that I've done in my life. So the first cue is a standard USGS topo map. And the second, the A is an infrared imagery and the lightning bolt is a just natural color. And then the QC is LIDAR data and all of this data is spatial. So you can see the roads actually running through all of the data. So I made all of this and it's all based on uh, data that Wolpert collected or in the case of the Bates map, data that's publicly available. So I'm a dog mom. And he's practically nocturnal with all of the other meetings that I have to be on during the day. And as you can see here, he totally talks back to me. So I'm gonna apologize in advance if he manages to make appearance during the presentation, but he's really cool and really sweet. And if you're like, what kind of little doodle is that? He's not a doodle. He's actually a Spinoni Italiano. And so he's a hunting dog. He's trained to go and point and retrieve birds. He's versatile and he's a big teddy bear. He was actually a teddy bear for Halloween. Yes, I made him wear a costume. So to talk a little bit about me, I started out in my career in general when I went into undergraduate thinking for sure that I would be pre-vet or a photographer. Well, in 2000, and I know I just dated myself horribly, <laughs> I went to the vice presidential debate as a photographer. And I realized then as I stood there next to US News and World Report, Time and Newsweek, all with the same cameras as me, all sitting there waiting for the, the candidates to breathe, take a breath, wipe their head, or like take their glasses off, that typical journalism just wasn't gonna be for me. Photojournalism wasn't gonna be for me. It was too tedious. So I moved on. And the way that I moved on is that I went into the GIS field and I got really lucky because as I progressed through anthropology, which was my career, I, um, my, sorry, my choice of specialties in school, clearly I've been in the professional world too long. Um, I went into GIS with anthropology and sociology. So my undergraduate advisor said when I was looking for an RANTA position, said, hey, why don't you come help me with this GIS stuff? And I did, and I loved it. And we went on to create the first GIS course at Center College. And so when that advisor asked me what I wanted to do with my life, I said, I wanted to have a camera on my neck, a GPS unit on my back, and a GIS enabled computer in the field doing anthropology. Well, my dream job took a little bit of a sidetrack and hit some steroids pretty hard because the camera is in the belly of the plane, the GPS unit's on top, and I am, Wolpert is a Esri business partner. And so we have all the GIS software that I can dream of. And while I don't actually do anthropology, the data that I create helps people to do anthropology. If you actually look up the Mayan ruins and things along those lines, they're using LIDAR to penetrate the dense vegetation to find various different ruins that they couldn't see before. How cool is that? Like I said, it's my dream job on steroids. And when I asked my professor that, he said to go into GI, to go to graduate school. Well, in graduate school, I found out that I love the nitty gritty details of metadata. And that's what we'll show. I'll show you a little bit. Or I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's my niche. And then lastly, I'm spatial. You add spatial into things and it just really makes things a little bit more special. Um, and I, I love to say the canned thing of spatial is special. You know, location, location, location. How many times have you heard that sort of stuff? And by the way, these two images are Arlington, Texas and Baltimore, Maryland. So how did I get here? Ah, deep breath. I am an avid photographer, as I talked about before. My father actually said I was born with a camera in my hand. Clearly I wasn't, but I've had 
hundreds and hundreds of photos published either through little tiny local newspapers or my college yearbooks and my high school yearbooks and newspapers. And then I've also done things that are a little bit more major than that. I've had several different cover photos published, which in the photography industry is huge. I've even been a sponsored student at several really cool organizations, one of which is North American Nature Photographers Association, NAMPA for short. Uh, and we are, and so I love it. It's just something that really makes sense to me and I really enjoy doing. And um, it was it's something I shared with my father. So I feel very fortunate that photogrammetry exists. And what that means is basically that we're taking those camera photos that the planes collect for us or the sensors in the planes collect and making them rectified and doing things with them. We're making them look like Google Earth. Yes, I know that's exactly it. But if you look at your local township, your local city, and you find their GIS or even Kentucky from above, that's our data. That's the data that I help create. So then I went on to take anthropology and sociology and I've already totally killed that. So I won't continue on that line. But then in my master's is from the University of Minnesota and I just finished it. It took me forever, but I didn't give up. And the other thing that the lesson here for me is that question that you don't ask is always that perpetual, like maybe, but probably not. So my advice is that you actually want to ask that question. And that's what I did. I got to go to my first Ezra user conference and I saw my graduate professors there. I asked them and said, well, is it possible so in July 2019, I had the, yeah, I think that's possible. I'll have to check. So all but thesis towards my master's, which doesn't really translate that much. But anyway, I managed to finish my thesis. And I actually have a link to that at the end of my slides if you want to check it out. <clears throat> so while I was in graduate school, I worked for the DNR, which is Department of Natural Resources. And in there, I was helping to digitize Land and Water Conservation Fund Act. Uh, purchases. So what they do at the DNR is that they're basically gifted pieces of land that they usually turn into parks and they have to document where those are. So I was going into old plats and things along those lines and figuring out exactly where that data was. <clears throat> From there, all but thesis towards my master's, realized that my advisor was going on sabbatical, so I had absolutely no clue when I'd be able to finish, I moved back to Kentucky. I went to, I fumbled around a little while, still doing photography, and managed to go to a couple career fairs where I found through somebody's sister's father's brother's, like third cousin twice removed or something really crazy, photo science. Because back then, it was hard to find them on the website when you do GIS job searches, because it's not a typical GIS job. So there, I had the opportunity to do a lot of different things. I was hired as a GIS tech, and that is what I stayed the entire time I was employed there for 11 years, nothing wrong with that, because it offered me so many opportunities to do so many different things. And they realized that since my master's was probably going to be on metadata, that they'd help me, write, they'd have me help write metadata. And I did, I helped them with that, but I also managed to get the wonderful honor of taking all of the ortho processes from start where you're planning the job of how are you gonna fly it to finish where you're delivering it to the client and almost everything in between. I got to do all of it. I even got to fly in the planes. So it was super cool. But um, the Quantum had lost the small company feel that it had when I was hired. And so I had started to quietly start looking and through all of my connections with ASPRS, which is American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and ERISA, Urban Regional Information Systems Association, commonly known as the GIS um, organization or that helped with GIS professionals. I, through them, I was able to find another job at Wolpert. I started out as a phase manager in aviation and I'll show you an example of some of my work from there in a little bit. And then I became team lead at quality control 
And now I'm starting to slowly move into working on estimation and project support. So eventually my next move was that I'll probably get to be a PM. And that's what my group is going to try and do. We're trying to actually like read really good PMs because that's where the project starts and that's where the project finishes. It's where our communication through um, to the client. And I realized phase manager means absolutely nothing to you guys. Phase manager is somebody who is actually managing the dollars and the like actual work of making sure it's things are done on time, making sure everybody understands everything that's going on inside of that project. It's a little bit more communication on one piece of that project. So for example, when you look at how a photogrammetry project like an airport, what we do is we go out and we fly the imagery. So that's a phase collection. And then we process the imagery and we turn it into orthos. So orthophotography is another. And then inside of the orthos, and by the way, ortho just means a straight photo or a straightened photo. So, you know, when it's flown, it may be skewed somewhat, but we're taking it and putting it cardinal directions. Uh, then we uh, take those orthos, they, to make them, you need to have a surface like what's on the screen of Indiana, you need a dumb. And that's what this is. And by the way, this is another one of my fun Photoshop creations that I just, every once in a while, I'll go out and find data and have fun with it. And Indiana is partial to me um, right now because we have been working on it an awful lot. And I have gotten to go to several of their Indiana conferences. So anyway, that's probably enough about where I'm at right now. Um, because we will get to talk more about what I do when we look at what Wolpert is doing. So metadata, it's boring. Nobody really wants to talk about it, but it's important for me to tell you about this because what's going on is that this was my niche. This is what I found that I was super passionate about. You guys, this was a little tiny section of my graduate school. Yeah, I'd seen it when I was an undergraduate, but I hadn't really done anything with it. So I had this one assignment, literally one assignment. And it was, what is this data? Can you figure out what it is? And we didn't know what it was. We didn't know where it was. We didn't know if it was projected correctly or anything like that. And to me, that was just like the coolest assignment to try and find that why behind this random shape file that my teacher had given us. And it also was, hey, if this data had any kind of metadata on it, the time that I spent trying to figure out where it was would have been take cut in half. So to me, metadata is that nutrition label on your data. So imagine this can, you don't know what it is, and I'm gonna you know, bet you, are you willing to let me open it up? Well, actually, wait, before I even open it up, I'm gonna pinch your nose and I'm gonna blindfold you. Probably use a clothespin so I can you know, manage to operate the can opener, right? I'm opening it up and I'm gonna, bet you that you're willing, whether or not you're willing to take a bite of it. You don't know if it's expired. It could be cat food. It could be tuna. If you're lucky, it's tuna. Or it could be some random mystery meat that you have no clue what it is. You could be allergic to it. It could be from a foreign country. You don't know. So if you're not willing to take that bite of this food, then you shouldn't be willing to consume the data that is given to you without metadata. Now, that sounds like I'm really strict about what metadata is. I'm not, I'm not. I've learned through the years that one of the things that becomes very important with metadata is it has to be usable to the people who are writing, to the people who are going to be using it, right? It's, it's super intuitive, uh, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes people say, oh man, I have to hit this rigorous standard. And when they do that, they are crippling it because some people are going to get it and they're going to toss it aside and they're never going to read it. So we're back to the can that doesn't have a label. So what I think of as metadata is everything from the file name, the folders that are stored in it. And even just like if you've got that on a hard drive and you put a post-it note and you wrote on that post-it note, that's literally metadata. So take it easy and like don't beat yourself up on it. Make it easy for you. And again, that is literally what I do for a living is make metadata easy for our clients and try to make sure that when somebody says, hey, we need CSDG and metadata, I know alphabet soup, <laughs> that 
I give them exactly what they need and maybe a little bit more so that they meet some stat standards, but not too much more. And by the way, CSDGM, as I take a big breath because it's a long word, is content standard for digital geospatial metadata. And that is hosted by FDUC, which is Federal Geographic Data Committee. Yes, I have these memorized. And yes, at one point in my life, I could do that all in my sleep. A little bit further removed from it, but I still know my CSDGM tags. So it's enough about metadata because it is super boring. And one of the things that Jeremy wanted me to talk about was being a woman in GIS. So although my name doesn't really indicate that I'm a woman, I am. <laughs> and uh, I've been, I've worked at Quantum when I, I think I started out and there were about, I was one of seven women in production. And as you can see here, there's a lot more. Now, not all the people in this photograph are in production, so the numbers are skewed. But I also know as I look at this photograph that not all the women in production are in this photograph. And this was a couple of years ago as well. So it's changed a little bit, but I, I am floored by the fact that I was started out as one of seven and somewhere in the middle of the 11 years that I worked at Photoscience, I think I was one of two other women. So two total. So it was me and one other woman that worked at Quantum Spatial. And, and again, that it's drastically different now. I can't quote you the numbers because I haven't worked there for ages. And even when I left four years ago, they had more women then than they did when it was at its lowest point. But of all the time that I've been in the industry, 15 plus years, I um, feel incredibly fortunate to have never really seen any kind of bias. Um, and. I'm standing on the shoulders of all the women that came before me and all of the things that they have done for me. So to be able to make it such that I don't see it. Um, the one time that I came even remotely close to seeing it was justified. And that is that it's, can you deal with flying in the planes and doing the things, doing the heavy lifting, literally heavy lifting, those cameras are really heavy that are required of a camera operator or a sensor operator. And then the other thing is that, well, when you, when you like test somebody out for a new career, you're gonna make sure that they fit into the culture. Well, it's a little bit more serious when you're out on the road in the planes. If people don't get along there and they're in the air and they just can't stand each other, it's like a lot bigger deal. You're putting your life in your pilot's hands. And all the pilots that I've flown with have been amazing people. I love them all to death. They're so great. They've just been fantastic. So it was never a problem for me, but I can't imagine if I'd gotten up into the plane and they'd been sexist pigs, it would have been horrible. And they weren't, they definitely weren't. They were all amazing. So again, I, I think that a large part of everything that's going on with women to GIS is due to the proactivity that everyone has had has come before me. Um, and, and I'm grateful, I'm very grateful to that. And again, I haven't seen the stereotypes or anything like that. And maybe I've missed it because people don't realize when they're in, immediately looking at an email from me that I'm a girl, but um, again, I, I'm just so grateful that it's been easy for me compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago when it wasn't there. And actually there are people in this photograph who have been working in GIS for a really long time. Several of them are now retired, but uh, yeah, they, they were there. They enabled us by being fantastic at their job. They've made it easy for all the other women. So all right, let's look at Wilbert itself because this is a great segue into it. So we are growing. This slide is about a year old and let's see what it is now. So we're now five more offices worldwide and a hundred plus more employees. Still founded in 1911. And um, I think that's, you know, we are growing and it is so amazing to be involved with a company that is growing. 
We have 25 plus crosses, offices across the nation. Uh, we even have one in Lexington, um, but none of us are in our offices right now. There's a select people who do go into the office still, but with the pandemic in general, we're not in there. I had to go back for the first time since March last week, and it's just so totally different. It's, it's weird. It's like, it's this weird ghost town. Um, in fact, I even took my dog in, which was a lot of fun. Um, he thought it was great. Even though he hates car rides, he was like, oh, people, this is awesome. So again, to continue to show you how we're growing um, without making this too much of a sales pitch for Wolpert. Um, back a year ago, we were at 300 plus ge geospatial staff and 100 plus cities. And now we're at 400 plus geospatial professionals. And literally this is almost exactly a year old between the two slides um, that marketing put together to us. And I lost the other one, but it's still super awesome. We've got a lot of experience. We know what we're doing. We can, I consider us quality firm. And that is one of the huge reasons why I joined Wolpert is that they do afford me the opportunity to actually focus on quality. They take it seriously. And proving that is their ISO compliance. ISO compliance is not necessarily easy to get. And it's even harder, in my opinion, to keep up. And we do. We've kept up with it for many years now. Sorry, I don't know the exact number. But again, we take it seriously because we're expensive. And in my opinion, people get the quality that they pay for. We know what we're doing and we get the work. And again, to me, this goes back to the metadata concept of would you just put that random data into your mouth or into your GIS and let your GIS consume it or do analysis on it when you don't know its quality? It could, it, in some cases, a lot, not necessarily with what we do, but with that GIS data, if you're putting it into an E911 system, it could literally kill people if it's not correct because those emergency vehicles being routed to the site missed the turn because it was incorrect in their GIS and that would be horrible. So again, quality is important to take a slight sidetrack on, on that. So who do we work with? We work with just about everybody. Aviation, I talk about that a little bit because I'm a phase manager in it. Education, we are helping to build the schools um, because I haven't said this next slide yet, maybe I have them out of order, but we'll see here. Energy, which is cool, electric line sightings and pipeline companies and things along those sides on the GIS side. Facilities, so we work with casinos, cool sites in Dayton. Um, I'm trying to think of anything in Kentucky specifically and I can't right now, although our office in Cincinnati has worked across the river several different times. Government, which is a huge part of my office and my, my tasks. National security is also IT management and consulting or ITMC, parks and rec, transportation and water. So of, all, of these, I'm probably gonna focus the most on aviation, government, and um, a little bit of transportation. But if you guys have any questions about any of this, my contact information will be at the end of the show. And so you feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than willing to help you with any questions you have. Okay, so the slide that was a little backwards is that we are an architectural engineering and geospatial firm. Usually they go with AEC for the C being construction, but we're AEG. And that's a little different. And we're one of the few firms that are like that, but it's super cool because we work really well in all three sections of the company. And it's, it's just that much more spatial. And think about it, what I'd say, location, location, location. Architects need to know where their building's gonna go. Engineers need to know how that stuff's going to fit in to whatever they're designing and building in there too. And then, you know, we're the location. And I'm, so again, I'm biased, but we're, I work in the geospatial sector, although I've worked with the others. <clears throat> so geospatial, I think this is a port in Florida, but this is one of the slides that I was, we weren't really sure exactly where it was. And again, like for me, a lot of this is really pretty pictures. And I'm gonna probably blow through some of these pretty fast. <clears throat> So Maine is one of our statewide programs, and here's some infrared imagery. So what this is, instead of being natural color, you just combine the different bands in a different order, and it'll show up and really show how healthy your vegetation is. So the red is 
is actually the healthy vegetation and the green blue in this one. As I look at the wrong camera, still not used to how you use Zoom, but it is, um, is gonna be a more of a rock-like feature. And then you can see the blue is still water. <clears throat> And here, this one to me totally looks like an image, but it's not. It's actually LIDAR data. In some of the places, if you look really carefully, you can see the degradation of the buildings in some corners. But in general, if you're looking at the center of the image, it's sharp and it's tight. And what I think that we did is we actually draped the imagery over those points and that's how we got the 3D effect of it. Um, and and it, it's super, super dense data. Um, you're talking about just tons of points per square meter and it's QL zero. Don't drill me on those numbers, but if you do, if you are interested in that, I can point you to the right people to talk to about it. <clears throat> and this is an airfield management. And again, this is the kind of work that I was started out doing at Wolpert. And what we do is we look at the airfield and this one's easy because it's Houston and it's flat. But think about some of those airports in Kentucky where they've top, chopped off the top of that mountain. Planes are coming in and they're landing. And what they need to know is how much have the trees grown up around that airfield if there's something like that. Or you know, some of them you're, you're gonna drop into a valley and land because it just basically needs to be flat. So are there any things that if they have a, a horrible thing happen, OEI, one engine op inoperable, what are they gonna do? Where are they gonna be able to manipulate and move? And those are the kind of very, very detailed analysis that we do with our data. <clears throat> and um, you know, so here you've got a golf course and then a pipeline field and all those things are gonna be relatively low, but let's say they're gonna install a new tank in the pipeline, the pipe field or the, the um, storage tank. Um, they're gonna probably going to need to have something that's higher than that actual storage tank uh, to put that in. And if they do, and if it's close enough to the runways, is there going to be a destruction that's new on the, on the runway? So for example, if they had to put a crane in that's gonna be higher um, and the crane that they could get was just massive, then they'd have an obstruction that they'd have to make sure that everyone was notified about. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about the runways and airport airfield management. We'll get, I, I'll show you another one that's really cool later on too, to keep you listening. So here's Tennessee, and this is just LIDAR data as well. Um, nothing super special, and since it's Tennessee, I'm gonna move on. Hopefully there's not too many volunteer fans out there um, because I am very sports and com competitive. So here's a lava field as well. And again, this is LIDAR data, um, and this is actually a DIM. So DIM is digital elevation model. <clears throat> So again, I'm showing you all the really cool, super sexy data that we get to play with. Um, and again, that's why I love my job is that we do so many different things. And I think we do all of the different things really well too. So here's hydro feature extraction. So what we're doing here is all the rivers, all the lakes and all the ponds that are of certain sizes and streams as well. Again, there's going to be size differentiation there um, are collected. And this is often collected off of LIDAR data with imagery as support in a secondary answer. And this one's in Erie, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and this one is one that I'm still learning an awful lot about, but it's one of the really cool things is through remote sensing, we're figuring out where impervious surfaces are. So what's an impervious surface? It's anything that groundwater or rainwater can't penetrate easily, something where it's going to pool. So in this example, you see that all of the parking lots and all of the buildings are collected and then the storage tanks as well because that water is going to pool. <clears throat> so moving right along out of the geospatial sector just for a little bit and talking, touching briefly on engineering, um, we still partner with them and we are powering what is going on in that engineering group. Um, so this slide right here is, there's another bigger one in here, is actually from our mobile mapper, <clears throat> which is sitting inside of um, engineering, but it was um, a very geospatial initiative. In fact, the sensors that are on there are um, built by the same company who built our, built our LiDAR system. So, or one of our LiDAR systems. So the technology is interchangeable and a lot of the same concepts, although it's terrestrial or on the ground, um, still apply to what we do with the processing. 
So here's some numbers in here. I won't lie, this doesn't mean an awful lot to me, but I feel like the lead accredited professional and also licensed professional engineers is exactly the same as having so many geospatial professionals. Sorry, I'm not good enough to memorize it. So this is one of my favorite slides to move right along since I can't remember numbers very well tonight. Um, this is Paoli Airport in Indiana. <clears throat> and this one's special to me because what you're seeing here is actually what we ended up doing to finalize their runway. So they wanted to do a runway extension program. And you think about when you land an airplane, that's gonna put a lot of weight and a lot of stress on that runway. So you have to do certain things to make sure that that extension is going to be sustainable and not just cave in or sink in. And so we engineered that extension that you see standing out to make sure that it would meet all the specifications. And that was also combined with the obstruction analysis that I was talking about too. So we did it before and we did the obstruction analysis before and we did it after. And you can see here that, you know, it just produces this amazing image. Um, although this is dramatized a little bit, it's a dramatization, I guess I, I can't even say the words right anymore um, of what this looks like. And that plane is actually fake, but this one was cool too, because we didn't just use our planes, we actually used our UAVs and drones. So um, it was collected multiple different ways. And because the extension was such a small section of the project, we flew it before, during and after. And so we have all these really cool photos showing documenting the whole process of what we did. And again, that was a geospatial and a engineering project. So lastly, this is a mobile, this is that closer one for mobile mapping of what we're doing there with that. <clears throat> so what we do is we literally drive a van down the road and that's gonna collect a lot of different things that we can see. And in fact, even in this photo, you can see the road signs and things along those lines. And because we have that, we can then extract that data out and pull it out a lot faster than somebody who was going down with the road in a van and stopping and taking a GPS point every single time. Or think about this too, we can see like the cracks in the roadway and the sidewalks that are deteriorating. All of that can be scanned through in the vehicle driving data or you know like fake driving through and doing a fly through of the collected data. So it becomes very powerful for DOTs to be able to see their roadway and their infrastructure. Um, so again, this is one of those perks of working in the private industry. We get to do a lot of stuff. We have a lot of really well-trained people who know what they're doing and have a lot of fun while they're doing it. So in conclusion, here's all of my contact information and I will pause here for a couple seconds, let you read it. And hopefully you've enjoyed my tour through what it is like to be me in the private industry and spatially selecting the coolest parts of what I wanted to work on. Thank you for your time. And hopefully I'll hear from some of you soon. <laughs>